the CBS Radio Works Imagination, the theater of the mind. Today, the space merchants. Frederick Poles and C.M. Kornbluth's modern classic about the future when the wizards of high-pressure salesmanship take over. It's the story of Mitchell Courtney, a copy smith, star class with Fowler Shock and Associates, the biggest and greatest advertising firm of the future, and a tale of a rocket ride to Venus. As I rubbed depilatory soap on my face and waited for my beard to melt away, I switched on the news over the bathroom mirror. A funny little man whom I finally recognized as the president had given another speech last night. There was a shot of the Venus rocket squat and silvery on the Arizona sands. The report of rioting in Panama, the country underground probably. Then the phone rang. Hello. Chief, you're due at the office. Can't you see I'm dressing? Oof, why that time? Never mind. Why are you phoning me? Mr. Shawkins called a board meeting a half an hour early. He's going to name the head of the Venus Project today, so hurry. Uh, Hester, do me a favor. Will you call my wife, Dr. Nevin? Make an appointment at noon for Walter J. Silver. For who? Walter J. Silver. Are you crazy? Well, she won't talk to me, Hester. Use the fake name. Maybe I can get in. All right. Now get down here fast. <laughs> Down on Fifth Avenue, there wasn't a pedicab in sight. For a moment, I thought I had a Cadillac with two men pedaling it, but somebody else got it. I did the best I could. I hopped aboard the rolling northbound sidewalk and found myself hemmed in by a milling, perspiring group of consumers. I got off at Shock and Towers and rode the express elevator to our offices on the 182nd floor. By sheer luck, I'd just taken my seat with my fellow board members when Fowler Shockin walked in. Gentlemen, good morning. Good, good morning, morning, Mr. Shockin. Now, sit down, sit down. I'm going to stand for a moment. I've just come back on the moon rocket, as you know. I want to stretch my legs. How is our project on the moon, Mr. Shockin? Gentlemen, I'm proud. And I'm humble when I say it's successful. The mining ventures are bringing the people here on Earth. Many of the metals our forefathers exhausted long ago. The colonists seem quite untouched by the Conti revolutionists. Only instances of Conti sabotage in the past week. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear some reports on our other projects. Industrial anthropology? <clears throat> well, I wish to report that according to the Midnight Indices, all primary schools east of the Mississippi are being fed our Fowler Shock and Package school lunches, soy burger, and regenerated steak. <clears throat> now, these lunches are being packaged in our star's alias red which means that in the future, these young consumers will be completely conditioned to buying everything packaged in our special color, stars alias red. They'll have no choice. Magnificent, magnificent. Now, let's hear from point of sale. <clears throat> oh, well, Mr. Shockin', sir, we have tested our latest beverage, Coffeeus, in 15 key cities. Each sample of Coffeeus contains three milligrams of a simple alkaloid. Nothing harmful, but definitely habit-forming. After ten weeks, the customer is hooked for life. A cure will cost a thousand dollars, so... It's easier to buy more coffees. Three cups with every meal and a hot jug beside the bed at night. <clears throat> you know, uh, gentlemen, on my trip back from the moon, I begin to wonder, are we getting soft? No, sir, Mr. Shockhead. Thank you, Matt. But I wonder, were we doing enough for our consumers? Those consumers sleeping out there on the stairways. I know how lucky they are being able to buy the wonderful goods we make, package and sell them, seaweed suits, Soya burger, regenerated steak, coffees, straw butt cigarettes. But I still wondered, were we in the upper classes of advertising getting soft? But now I've decided Fowler Shock and Associates is not soft. That it's ready to meet a challenge greater than our organizing India into one giant cartel. Greater than our development of the moon. The greatest challenge the world of advertising and promotion has ever met. The colonizing of Venus. <laughs> Shockin' sense of the dramatic was never better. The touch of a button on the conference table before him, the lights were dimmed. Another touch of a button, and one wall of the room became a giant projection screen. 
We are looking at it again. The Venus Rocket. But this time we knew that one of us would be named to head the Venus Project. There she stands, gentlemen. The Venus Rocket. A thousand-foot monster. Surrounded now by steel scaffolding and a glow with welding torches. And here's how you'll see her six months from now, just before the takeoff. Just before the takeoff, there's the ship that Congress gave us, Fowler, Shock, and Associates. There's the ship that will span the stars. Six and a half million tons of trapped lightning and steel. A rocket-powered Mayflower for 1,800 pioneers seeking a new world to settle. Who will man it? Gentlemen, it's our job, A, to justify my buying enough congressmen to vote us that rocket. B, to sell 1,800 crazy consumers on giving up life on the Earth for the sulfur and nitrogen and canned life on Venus. Yes, sir, Mr. Shocken. Yes, sir. I've made my choice of the man to head up our Venus rocket project. His name is Mitchell Courtney. Hi. <laughs> Congratulations, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Terrific break for a young and experienced guy. Yes, I'm flattered. Fowler seemed to be sure he uh, knew what he was doing. He seemed to be sure. Well, drop into my office any time you need advice. Yeah, thanks. I'll keep my back to the wall. <laughs> Good luck with Venus Project, Mitch. As far as I'm concerned, you can't sell people on life in a sardine can, even if you throw in a slave girl as a premium. <laughs> This way, Mr. Silver. Dr. Nevins will see you now. Dr. Nevins? Mitch. Mitch, how did you get in? I used another name. I had to see you, Kathy. After all, you're my wife. I am not your wife. My certificate's on fire. Mine isn't. It never will be. As soon as this year is up, we're through. No, wait. I've got some news. Well, what is it? I've been put in charge of the Venus Project at the agency. Congratulations. Oh, Kathy, I love you. I'm, I'm not above using this promotion as an excuse to celebrate. Won't you go out on the town with me tonight? No. Well, I promise not to make a scene. You're the only one I want to celebrate with. All right, Mitch. My apartment at seven. And now let me take care of the sick people. <laughs> Outside Kathy's office, I hailed a two-man Cadillac pedicab and told them to step on it to Shock and Tower. I took the express elevator to the top of the towers. I ran across the heliport to Shockin's private helicopter. I had a very important date out of New York's newest airport, at Montauk. I was due to meet the Earth's number one celebrity, Jack O'Shea. The first and only man who had ever set a rocket down on Venus and returned. As I landed, his jet was just coming in. And as I jumped to the ground, his jet moved up the runway toward me, and the place was crawling with women. Hmm, I'd forgotten what a swath Jack had cut with the women on his cross-country lecture tours... In fact, I'd almost forgotten until his Pinkerton cards cleared away through the vast crowds. I'd almost forgotten that Jack was a midget. Welcome to New York, Jack. Hello, Mitch. I hear you're number one boy now. Well, I still work for Fowler Shockin, Jack, but the Venus Rocket Project is mine. You're a fool to take it. Oh, you're joking. Am I? All right, fellas, Mr. Courtney's from Fowler Shockin. You can check off now. Yes, sir, Mr. O'Shea. Crummy guards. I never get a free moment. Well, that's the penalty for being a celebrity. This way, Jack, our helicopter's over here. Hey, hey, look out, Mitch. That cargo ship. Darn fool pilot. Run, Mitch, run! Hey, Mitch. Mitch, you all right? Yes, I'm okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mitch, that was no accident. That pilot had orders to get one of us. And I think it was you. I 
had to start pumping Jack O'Shea about Venus. Shockin was paying him a fat retaining fee as a consultant. Jack didn't seem to want to talk, however. I showed him projections, maps, drawings, charts. But he barely said a word worth recording on tape. Suddenly an idea hit me. I made a phone call. <laughs> oh, Kathy. Kathy, do you know that this is the first time I've laughed, really laughed, since I came back to Earth? Is it, Jack? <laughs> I'm complimented. <laughs> and that this is the first time I've been alone with two people since I came back? I thought you'd had enough of being alone in that rocket on Venus. It, uh... It must have been a shattering experience, Jack. Kathy, you're the first person who seems to have understood that. Not exciting. Not thrilling. It was frightening. Shattering, as you said. It wasn't at all like what I've told the women's clubs, the reporters. That's been a pack of lies. The atmosphere, for instance... It's really formaldehyde. Embalming fluid. Who'd understand that except the dead? And the heat, who'd understand that? Who's lived in heat above the boiling point of water? If there was any water on Venus, which there isn't. Why did you go, Jack? That's easy. You're a doctor. You know about midgets. We eat one-third the food, drink one-third the liquids, inhale and exhale one-third the air full-size humans require. They'd never have gotten that test rocket to Venus if I hadn't been the size I am, if I hadn't been a child who's been laughed at, who'd turned test pilot to prove myself. <laughs> I was so small they could pack me into that test rocket with all the equipment necessary to sustain me. Eighty-three days. It takes a lot of equipment to sustain even a midget. Six of those days were on Venus. What was it like, Jack? I think the closest thing on Earth is the painted desert. The wind blows hard. It tears rocks apart. Soft rocks disappear and make dust storms. The light is <laughs> funny. Nobody ever saw a light like that on Earth. Orangey, brownish light. Very, very bright, but threatening. And there's no water on Venus. No vegetation. No living thing. In the quiet of Kathy's apartment, Jack O'Shea talked for another hour. And suddenly, with hardly a word of goodbye, he stood up and walked out. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for changing plans and letting me bring him. Don't mention it, Mitch. Do you uh, think you got it all on your little tape recorder? <laughs> you knew I had one in my pocket. I was sure you would have. And I hope you play it back to yourself over and over and over. Oh, Kathy. Yes, over and over and over. Until even you were convinced how hopeless your Venus project is. Hopeless? Oh, oh. our science boys have answers to all those objections. Mitch. Mitch, doesn't that mind of yours ever stop selling somebody something? Do you have to be a contriving, selfish Machiavelli who served Fowler, Shocken, and never people? People? You mean Consumers. Oh, Mitch, must you always be top dog, making money, money, money without scruples, without ethics? What, what was that? A gunshot. Jack's out there. Now, I'll go and see. Oh, he's all right. Those are his steps. Mitch, Mitch, I was standing talking with a doorman and someone shot him in cold blood. Someone thought that doorman was you. Well, Mitch, trouble with the Venus project already? Uh, personal trouble, Mr. Shockin. Personal trouble? Yes, yesterday afternoon a cargo helicopter tried to drop its full load on me. Last night somebody tried to shoot me. I've had a couple of head-on collisions with Matt Runstead. 
Are you accusing a shocking man? That's treason. Killing an agency employee is an offense against the United States government. Any idea who's behind this? No. Well, it might be the Conchies, of course. Well, conservationists hate us. They're trying to sabotage everything we want to do, but they're crazy, mixed up, unorganized. They want to go back to the old days when we had natural wood, natural water, all that sort of pot trap. Forget them. Well, it could be another advertising agency. Uh, it could be. But look, Mitch, I made you copy Smith, star class, because I thought you could live up to your responsibilities. Now, you're young, but you have power. Five words from you, and a few months later, half a billion consumers will find their lives completely changed. That's power. Absolute power. So you must remember, power has its compensation and its hazards. That's all. With this encouragement, I continued work on the Venus Project for the next six weeks. I even talked Kathy into giving up her patience for 48 hours and taking a flying trip with me to Arizona. I wanted to get the feel of the giant rocket itself as it was being built. Your credentials, please. Army intelligence, check. Navy intelligence, check. Air Force intelligence, check. FBI, check. AEC, check. CIA, check. Four A's, check. I hope you two are all right. This way, please. Kathy and I followed the security officer into the vast steel shell of the Venus rocket. Well, 157 feet high. More cubits than the average New York apartment building. He took us into the dormitories for the 1,800 pilgrims I had to sell on the idea of going to Venus. Low cycle food, water, and air regeneration. One third living space, one third drive, one third freight. It was an inferno and a promise of paradise, a monument to 22nd century engineering, and an incomparable monument to the sheer artistry of the machine. Mitch, do you always have to talk like a copysmith? Huh? Oh, oh, I noticed you were impressed too, Kathy. Well, it draws me and repels me. I can't explain it. It excites me. Kathy, how would you like to go on to San Diego with me? Whatever for? Well, Matt Runstead's boys in our San Diego office have been gathering test figures on our sample colonizing campaign. Very helpful. No, I, uh, I can't come, Mitch. I'd love to, but my patients back in New York need me. Oh. Well, then I'll get you aboard the return jet and see you in New York in 48 hours. <laughs> I didn't tell them I was coming to San Diego. I walked in on our entire San Diego staff playing push-button poker. What's the meaning of this? Oh, who are you, mister? Mitchell Courtney. Well, it's Courtney from New York, fellas. What are the reports on the Venus sampling, Harris? There aren't any, sir. Tally sheets, punch card codes, sigma progress charts. Nothing on the attitudes of consumers toward life on Venus? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing. Uh, you've made up everything you've given me so far. Well, I'm afraid so, sir. Well, get New York on the line. I want Matt Runstead. Well, he's not there. Well, where is he? Well, he called this morning. He's taken off for Little America to look after our interests there. And left you holding the bag, huh? Find out when the next jet leaves for Little America. Little America is a dollar trap for the tourists of the world, conceived and promoted by Fowler Shockin. A clerk at our hotel told me Runstead had checked in for a two-day tour of the Stars Alias Glacier. That he already had started out on the trail. I rented the glacier equipment, Antarctic coveralls, hood, gloves, boots, and power pack to warm them. And on my back, I had an EDF that went beep, beep when I was on the trail, and beep, beep when I lost my way in the snow. I set out after Runstead, beeping and still mad. I stopped after a while and cooked a meal in my electric pocket. It wasn't bad. Well, very bad. I had some coffee to pep me up, and then I set out again. My feet hit a drift, and I stumbled. 
The wind was blowing stronger now. The snow flurries were more frequent. I must have gone on another hour. How far in distance, I don't know. And then up ahead, I saw the figure of a man. Matt! Matt Blunstead! Matt! Matt Courtney! Matt, I've been following you! Matt! What do you want with me, Matt? I want to know what happened in the San Diego office. What are you up to, Matt? A sudden blast of wind hurled snow into my face, and then, as it cleared, I saw Matt raising his skis high above his head. I saw them coming down toward me as he poleaxed me. The CBS Radio Workshop has brought you part one of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles Monroe, with original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlowski. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Stotts Cotsworth starred as Mitch Courtney, Virginia Kay as Kathy. The sound effects were devised by Tom Buchanan and Tom Perkins. The engineer, Jack Katz. This is Ted Pearson inviting you to join us next week for the second part of the CBS Radio Workshop production of the Space Merchants. The CBS Radio Workshop has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. cargo jet in the 22nd century. Here's a man we had trouble with in the hold, Lieutenant. What's his complaint? Well, he claims he's Mitchell Courtney, a copy smith star class of the Fowler's Shock and Advertising Company. He says he's been shanghai aboard this jet. Roll up his sleeve. Let's see his social security tattoo. Uh, 1304 1-304-9974-1416-156-187723. Liar! Get him out of here. If he's with Shock and Advertising, he'd have a low number. Can't you see it's been altered? Let me use the radio and talk to Mr. Shock and himself. <laughs> Where from, Mr. Courtney? The dead? Take a look at this copy of today's New York Times, dated February 17th, 2157. Mitchell Courtney, head of the Venus Rocket Project at the Fowler Shock and Advertising Firm, has been found dead in Little America. Now, wait a minute. A man by the name of Matt Runstead knocked me out there. But can't you see that I'm alive? I am Mitchell Courtney. <laughs> you can prove that after ten years. Ten years? My manifest shows that you're not an advertising man. You're only a consumer named George Groby. You've signed up for ten years' labor in Costa Rica. And those ten years begin as soon as this jet sets down. Take him back to the hole. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The CBS Radio Workshop continues part two of The Space Merchants by C.M. Kornbluth and Frederick Pohl. Today, the workshop resumes the story of Mitchell Courtney, copysmith star class with the world's greatest advertising agency of the future, Fowler Shock and Associates. The tale of a rocket ride to Venus. I lay on my filthy bunk in the hold of the cargo jets, trying to think of a way to get back to New York. I wanted to find out why Matt Runstead had knocked me out and had me shanghaied. Who wanted to get me off the Venus Project, the advertising campaign we dreamed up to colonize Venus? 
I wanted to get back to my wife, Kathy. But there was nothing I could do until this cargo jet landed in Costa Rica. Move, you scum skimmers! Get in line! Now, what's your name? Mitchell Courtney. Mitchell Courtney. Oh, yeah. You're the bum we had trouble with on the plane. Oh, sorry, my name is George Groby. Oh, well, that's better. What do you want to do here, Groby? Got any choice of job? Anything. Anything the sun-drenched plantations of Costa Rica have to offer. I'm here to clasp the death's hands of independent farmers with pride in their work. I'm here to extract the juicy, ripe goodness of chlorella protein. Say, how'd you learn that? That's our prime impact commercial. Learn it, I wrote it. But don't let that stand in your way. Groby, you're not going to get anywhere being a wise guy. Yes, sir. You're assigned as a chlorella scum skimmer third class. Report for duty and assignment to a bunk at Tier 48 in Dormitory Z. The heart of chlorella products is a strange, glutinous, ever-growing organism called Chicken Little. It provides one-third of the world with the protein that replaces old-fashioned meat. It grows in huge, sweating vats. And only the constant slicing keeps it from overgrowing and covering Costa Rica and its neighbors, or in time, the face of the earth. I had written of its delights many times in the agency, but I now came to know it at first hand. I was assigned to skim the scum which dripped from its side. <laughs> she stinks pretty bad, don't you, Orke? She's high, her <laughs> But she's beautiful, chicken little, eh, Orke? Well, but she's pretty awful. <laughs> Orke, this is the first time I ever hear you say the advertisements are wrong. <laughs> Go into town with me tonight, eh, Orke? I'd made one friend, a master slicer named Herrera. He'd been aloof and standoffish at first, befitting his high station, but now he'd befriended me, done me a lot of favors. I didn't know why until that night we went on the town to a dark, almost empty cafe. Porque I have watched you very carefully. You don't belong here doing this work. Well, don't I? How am I ever going to get out? You have the brains, Orke. Not like the others. Oh, thanks. What good are brains here? I'm so tired half the time I can't think. Orke, I'm going to put my life in your hands. Do you ever hear of the consis? The consis, of course. You know what the consis stand for? Sure, World Conservation Association. I mean their ideas. Oh, I know you have heard they are dangerous. They want a revolution. They want to go back to the old ways. Real meat, real grains and fruit. They want a break for the consumer, they say. Nothing in packages, nothing tested and guaranteed. Do you think they are so wrong? After six months here? Here, Orge, take this pamphlet. Read it. Then talk to me again. Or denounce me. I am not afraid. The Conci Underground opposed everything a self-respecting 22nd century advertising man like me believed. I would have denounced Herrera to the Chlorella authorities the next day, except for one thing. If I joined the Concis first, if I learned their organization and secrets, I'd have a better bargaining position in getting back to New York. I joined them. The irony was the Contes were a lot better organized than I'd suspected. And after six months, they decided they needed me in New York. And it was they who engineered my return to the city. I returned to New York on a secret mission for the Contes. Two weeks after being in New York, I got the secret sign to attend a Conci meeting at the Metropolitan Museum. As my first taste of luxury in more than a year, I hailed a Cadillac pedicab and told the driver to take me to the Metropolitan Museum. You can't do better than to visit the Metropolitan Museum, mister. World's greatest masterpiece. Don't miss the painting on the first floor. It's called, I Dreamed I Was Ice Fishing in My Wonder Form Bra. Yeah, I read it brought a million and a half. Not a satellite. And don't miss the theatrical collection. They got dancing cigarettes. Say, uh, you mind if we stop a second? These new Cadillac cabs are hard to pedal. 
Okay, get out. Oh, no, you don't. What's the idea of the gun? I recognize you when you walked out of Grand Central, Mr. Mitchell Courtney. What, what do you want with me? I want you to get out of the cab and come with me to the Taunton Agency. They've offered a big, fat, juicy reward for anybody who'll bring them the inside story of Fowler Shockin's Venus Rocket Project. And you're the boy who headed it up. So you're the boys who shanghaied me and got me off the project. No, we're not. I don't know who did. But we're sure glad we found you. The boy with all those nice secrets about colonizing Venus. Taunton wants those secrets. Come on, get out of here. Hey, drop that gun. Drop it or I'll break your neck. <laughs> grabbed the gun and hit him behind the ear. Then I ran across Fifth Avenue and lost myself in a group of consumers on the sidewalk rolling back toward Shocking Towers. I jumped off and ran to the express elevator. I walked down the corridor to Shocking's office. It was dark and deserted. Then down the corridor, I saw a light under my old office door. I walked up to it. I didn't knock. Esther. <gasps> Mitch! Oh, no. Esther, it's all right. I'm alive. Oh, but, but Mitch, they said you were dead. Who? Matt Lundstedt? Yes. Everyone believed him. Did my wife? Did Kathy believe him, Hester? Yes. Well, get her on the phone for me. Call her. Oh, well, she's disappeared, Mitch. What? No one's been able to find her. After the news of your death, she just closed her office and disappeared. Maybe Shockin knows where she is. Where is Shockin, Hester? Well, he caught the moon rocket yesterday morning. He was going over your notes on the Venus Project. He's taking and... it over? Yes, from Matt Rudd's said. It was going bad. I'll bet. Matt's trying to ruin our campaign. Hester, you've got to get me aboard the next moon rocket. Use the name George Groby. Runstead and a Taunton agency will try to stop a man named Courtney. I've got a lot to tell, Mr. Shockin. <laughs> Passengers, this way, please. We are now on the moon. Tourists to the moon to the left, visitors on business to the right. Now, for a name. George Groby, copy analyst, class four. Groby, copy analyst, four. Oh. God, yes. this way, please. Yes, sir. This man says his name is George Groby. Fine. You're under arrest, Groby. Let go of me. I'm here to see Fowler Shockin. Mr. Runstead down on the earth told us to expect you. I don't know what you're talking about. You may be interested to know that your secretary, Miss Hester Barnes, is being tried for treason. Treason? She is charged with forging documents and passing them to you. The 43rd Amendment of the United States Constitution. Treason to any registered advertising agency is punishable by death. Hold him for the return passage and a similar charge, guard. The guard had his nightstick in my back as we walked down the streets. Past storefronts with signs, moon made fashions, stunning conversation pieces prove you were here. Souvenirs of Luna, cheapest in town. Moon suits rented 50 years without a blowout. Ye tasty goodie shop on ye moon. Warren Astron, readings by appointment only. Hold it. Uh, what is it? You sure your name's Groby? Positive. You ever know a man named Herrera? Well, yes, Herrera and I. Wish we could find out what you're up to, Groby. Send out a Costa Rica to report in New York. Never show up at a meeting there. Then you turn up at Fowler Shockin's agency and get your passage on a moon rocket. You mean you're a... Shut up. up. Now go into Astron's there. He'll hide you till our top boss up here comes. First take my nightstick and knock me out with it, then point it at the streetlight and blast it out. Hit me hard, but not too hard. Oh, this is going to cost me two strikes and a week's pay. Oh... My concy training was really paying off. Astron took me in stride, hid me in a room under his floor, gave me something to eat, and I fell asleep. I waked with a light pouring down into my face. You can come up now, Groby. The chief is here to see you. In that room back there. I'll see you're not disturbed. Thanks. Over here, into the light.
pipe, Mr. Groby. Kathy, Kathy, what are you doing here? Oh, Mitch, why didn't you stay on ice? What crazy thing have you done to turn up here? Go on. I'm crazy. Why shouldn't I be crazy? My wife, a kingpin concept. <laughs> what a shock. You, a star-class coffeesmith, married to a concept. Matt's one of you. You got Matt Runstead to Shanghai me. Mm, like a fool. I thought if I could get you away from Fowler's shock, and I might bring you to your senses. Trying to decide what was best for poor little Mitch. Mitch, I loved you. You loved me. You actually were in love with me. Yes, I was, in spite of everything you stood for. But you are not going to talk to Fowler Shock and me. I'm not. Mitch, I don't want you to ruin Venus the way you've ruined the world. A woman of ideals. What do you plan to do with me? Are you going to report to Fowler Shockin? Yes. Then there is nothing I can do for you. Then let me tell you something before you turn me over to Astron and your friends outside. I've been shanghaied, robbed of my name, forced to work like a slave in the tropics. I've had all I can take of others deciding what to do about poor old Mitch. Your guard friend left this nightstick with me. You know what it does, Kathy. Get on that phone and call Fowler Shockin and tell him where I am. Then get out. Take your friends with you. I'll give you two days to vanish. But this time, stay out of sight forever. Go on. Call Shockin. This is Dr. Nevin, Mitchell Courtney's widow. I'd like to speak to Mr. Shockin, please. Mitch, my boy, I'm going to fatten you up and turn Venus section back to you. You know my policy. Find a good horse, give him his head, and back him to the limit. You've never let me down. And Venus section's in rotten shape. Nobody's applying for space on the Venus rocket. The whole campaign's at sea. The indices are down to 3.37 for North America. They should be four and rising. We've got to get those 1,800 consumers on board the Venus rocket. When we got back to Earth, Matt Runstead had disappeared. I arranged for Hester to be released from Alcatraz, and she returned in triumph in Shockin's private jet. I began to whip the Venus rocket project back into shape. I was living again, writing new jingles, starting new rumors by word of mouth, developing new techniques, until finally... Mitch, the big day has come. 1,800 consumers have volunteered to ride our rocket to Venus. Now, I've arranged for Congress to meet tomorrow, and my boy... I want you to address them as Fowler Shockin's personal representative requesting a takeoff date. Gentlemen, the Senate is now in session. You all received a recording of the opening prayer last night. So let's hear from the Senator from Chlorella Limited. Uh, the senator from Colorado Limited passes in deference to the senator from Alaska Mining. The uh, senator from Alaska Mining passes in favor of the senator from United Steel and Smelting. The senator from United Steel and Smelting passes in favor of the senator from Caribbean Fruits. The senator from Caribbean Fruits passes in favor of the senator from Yummy Cola. My dear fellow senators, I thank you all for graciously allowing me to speak before we pass upon this very important bill concerning the Venus rocket. The people of this great republic of ours, extending from Atlantic seaweed to Pacific fish. Suddenly I sensed something had gone wrong. I'd been sitting back thinking about Kathy, thinking of her face, her voice, her smile before we'd married. I was wondering where she was, what she thought of all this. Then the speaker's voice focused my attention upon him... I hadn't been worried. Fowler Shockin owned two-thirds of this gathering. But there was something about old yummy Cola that troubled me. He wasn't addressing his fellows. He was looking up addressing me. A big grin on his face. I leaned forward just in time for the weenie. In a brief discussion I had before this session, Mr. Taunton gave me some information in private. But I feel it my public duty to ask a couple of questions of Mr. Courtney, who is present. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if the name of George Groby is familiar to him. I would like to ask if Mr. Courtney is George Groby. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if, when he was known as George Groby, he was a member in good standing of the World Conservationist Association, known to most of us loyal Americans as the country.
below, there was a raging tidal wave of taunting congressmen and shocking congressmen battling. For the first time in history, shots were being fired in anger on the Senate floor. If Taunton hadn't tipped off old Yummy Cola, I knew who had. The conscience. Somehow I didn't mind. I realized that for some time now, I'd really been one of them. A little man beside me dressed in black suddenly seized my arm and led me out the side door. You'll find a car outside ready to take you to the airport, Mr. Courtney. What airport? Don't stop to ask questions. Just go wherever you're taken. You'll be protected. Fat chance. You'll be all right. I guarantee that. Who are you? The president. Good luck. God bless you. I had to admire that little man's courage. He'd walked back into that raging den of lions without a quiver. Aboard the jetliner, I wondered what would happen to him when they found out he'd sent me to safety. Or was it to safety? I tried to ask questions of the men aboard the liner, but they looked the other way and kept absolutely quiet. You can climb out now, Mr. Courtney. They're all ready for you over there at the Venus rocket. There's no time to lose. Say, look here, I don't want to go to Venus. <laughs> Who's in charge here? I won't go aboard that rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's aboard but you. Come on, Mr. Courtney. In you go. Last passenger, fasten them in for the takeoff. Last passenger, ready for the takeoff. Kathy, where are you? Up here, over your head. Stop floating around. Come down here and unfasten me. All right, I'll try. But we're beyond the law of gravity. We're on the way to Venus with 1,800 conservationists. How did you get out of a harness? A steward set me free, then floated away. I have to talk to you. <laughs> me? You threatened to kill me, remember? Yes, I remember. You could have, Mitch, in time. But you never told Shockin who or where I was. Why didn't you? Because I love you, Kathy. And I think that for a long time I've been coming over to your side. And you're willing to face life on Venus? Yes. It's time people got a break. People, not consumers. Oh, I like hearing you say that. And I love you too, Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Mitch, you broke my hold on your harness. Come back here. I just wanted to put my arms around you. Oh, there'll be plenty of time for that on Venus. Come back here. Unbuckle your harness and catch me. I can't. Uh, who invented this crazy gimmick anyway? Oh, Mitch. Mitch, you've stopped talking like an advertising man. Kiss me. CBS Radio Workshop has presented part two of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles S. Monroe. Original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlowski. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. <laughs> CBS Radio Workshop has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.